Today, a public inquiry into this scandal begins because British Columbians deserve to know three simple things. First, how was this problem allowed to grow? Was it the negligence encouraged by large bureaucracies and people working in silos? Was it willful blindness to the source of lucrative income for private and public accounts? Was it corruption, or was it something else entirely? Second, who is doing this? Why don't we see arrests of money launderers? Why do we not see prosecutions? Is it true Canadian police prefer to support the arrest of money laundering suspects in the United States instead of advancing cases here at home? If so, what do we need to fix? Finally, how big is this issue? How exactly are money launderers working in our economy, and how can we best stop them? Fiat justitia ruat silum is a Latin phrase some may know, especially in the legal community. It means let justice be done, though the heavens fall. The public and the government need this commission to identify the weeds that are choking beneficial activities in our economy and wreaking havoc in our communities so that they may be rooted out. The Commission must be fearless, because the consequences of failure to address this crisis and hold those responsible for its expansion and duration are serious and ongoing. These consequences include an overdose crisis, with deaths so numerous that the life expectancy of the entire province has been reduced. So numerous that the coroner's office of the province has had to expand capacity for storing bodies. The families and friends of those dead are grieving. More will join them. For other families, these consequences include a real estate market where, despite working hard, despite following the rules, they are competing directly with offshore trusts, numbered companies, straw buyers, tax evaders, and criminals for a place to live. They're competing, and they know they're not winning, and they're angry. British Columbia provided the Cullen Commission with a broad set of terms of reference so that justice may be done. The province has given this commission full independence to ensure it can do its job without being deterred by any political, partisan, or economic suggestion that the sky may fall if they do what they have been asked to do. It is exactly as the commissioner suggested in his introductory statement to the public. The commission's full allegiance must be to the people of British Columbia and to no other interest, priority, or agenda. I have two concerns about the success of the Commission in these early days. One is an issue I had raised previously about why government was initially reluctant to call an inquiry. The second one has arisen already in these very early days of the Commission's work. On the first, should the Commission uncover potential criminal wrongdoing, the government has respectfully requested the Commission work in a way that minimizes the risk to any prosecution. However, that is not the only value they must protect, and this value has a context. The context is that prosecutions and arrests are simply not hap happening to any degree approaching the scope of the problem. The reality is that this commission cannot interfere with prosecutions or arrests that are simply not happening, and without the commission's work, will never happen. I am concerned that the commission could be knocked off pace by a self-interested party, vexatiously raising concerns about some unspecified potential future prosecution or what could possibly be, but is currently not and may never be, a criminal investigation. We will encourage the Commission to interrogate any objections about potential investigations or prosecutions aggressively, because this is a public inquiry into criminal activities. Of necessity, by calling this Commission, government has accepted, and we will urge the Commission to accept, that they may need to walk into territory that is usually exclusively, but has not been for reasons that are unknown, the territory of the police. This balancing exercise between non-interference in criminal investigations and establishing a comprehensive understanding of how money laundering is working in our province will be difficult, but critically important to the success of the Commission. Shutting down lines of inquiry over-cautiously will undermine the overwhelming desire of British Columbians for a public airing of these matters. 77% of British Columbians wanted this inquiry called, according to a poll by a research company. 90% of British Columbians believe money laundering is a problem that needs to be addressed in our province, according to Angus Reid. The second concern is more disturbing in that it is playing out as I speak. It involves the simple and inexplicable failure of the previous government, the now opposition, to commit fully, in an unqualified way, to the disclosure of all relevant cabinet documents concerning money laundering to the Commission. The Commission has asked for these documents, and the only answer from our government and the previous government must be yes, of course. 
but that is not what is happening. According to a convention respected by governments in our province, cabinet documents of the previous administration remain confidential. This is a tradition that has been observed in our province for many government transitions. If for some reason an incoming government would like to access the cabinet documents of the outgoing government, the outgoing government appoints a person to oversee that process. For the outgoing BC Liberal government, that delegate is former finance minister MLA Mike DeYoung. You may recall that I asked MLA DeYoung and the leader of the opposition, Andrew Wilkinson, to agree to disclose confidentially all of the previous government's cabinet records related to money laundering to assist the new government in fighting this crime. In a process so independent I was not even aware it was happening, MLA Mike DeYoung was in contact with cabinet operations and obtained copies of all cabinet documents of the previous BC Liberal administrations related to money laundering following my request. These documents were identified as relevant to the issue of money laundering and compiled by independent public servants, and copies were provided to MLA DeYoung as the designated representative of the previous government. My request for government access to these cabinet documents was made over a year ago. I have not seen these documents. While frustrating, this is the right of the previous government under the tradition we respect as remarkable as it is that they would claim bold action on money laundering at the same time as refusing access to documents that would show exactly what steps were or were not taken. Until recent comments on the radio by MLA Wilkinson, I had no reason to believe MLA DeYoung and MLA Wilkinson were attempting to use this review of cabinet documents in relation to the Commission of Inquiry. My expectation, and I think the expectation of all British Columbians, would be that the BC Liberals would instruct the public service to disclose, without qualification, without censorship, the entire package of relevant cabinet records about money laundering directly to the Commission of Inquiry about money laundering. The reasons for letting the public service compile these cabinet documents and provide them directly to the Commission for review without interference from anyone is obvious. It saves the Commission the time of a court application to force disclosure. It saves the public the money that such a court application would cost. It acknowledges the urgency of the issue and the need to get to the bottom of things. And yet, when he was contacted by the Public Service to ask for permission to send Cabinet records directly to the Commission of Inquiry, MLA de Young responded that he would not give that consent. Instead, he has written a letter to government asking that he be the one instead of the Public Service, to determine which Cabinet documents the Commission, quote, requires to discharge its responsibilities, unquote. Beyond how simply unacceptable it is that anyone other than Commissioner Cullen is attempting to decide what Cabinet records relevant to money laundering the Commission requires, and which it does not, MLA de Young is the last person, perhaps the last person on Earth, who should be taking on this task. When I arrived on this job, I received a presentation from BC's gambling regulator. The regulator presented to me in great detail their reasonable and informed belief that lower mainland casinos were a hotbed of international money laundering. This is the same regulator that had been under the oversight and management of MLA de Young when he was finance minister. They shared with me a report commissioned by MLA de Young's former ministry, the Ministry of Finance, while he was minister of finance that said there was a serious money laundering problem in our province. In short, it is highly likely that Mike DeYoung had detailed personal knowledge of the money laundering scandal our province was facing from his time as finance minister. And yet, when he was minister responsible for gaming and finance minister, he either kept all of this secret or he was so bad at his job he had no idea any of this was going on. Either way, it does not recommend him for the job of deciding what the Commission is required to have access to in order to do its job. By way of contrast, the NDP government immediately released the secret report, advised the public of the extent and basis of our concern about money laundering, hired an expert to help us solve the problem, and banned bulk cash and shopping bags from our casinos. All reasonable, necessary, and overdue steps. It is also highly relevant that MLA de Young, also when he was finance minister, cut pages out of an independent report about ICBC before releasing it to the public in order to conceal recommendations about how to avoid potential future losses that then in fact materialized as billion dollar deficits at ICBC in 2017 and 2018. So a person who either does not understand what significant documents and major issues look like, or in the alternative, 
who has a history of concealing from the public not just sections of reports, but entire reports, has appointed himself the person who will determine which of the previous government's cabinet records related to money laundering are, quote, required, unquote, by the Independent Commission of Inquiry. Even worse, beyond his at best poor history of document management, MLA de Young is likely to be a significant witness in this proceeding with great personal interest in the outcome. He is in a profound conflict of interest. Why would the public have any confidence that he would release to a public inquiry cabinet documents that could be profoundly damaging to his professional reputation should such documents exist? I will be responding to MLA de Young and advising both him and Mr. Wilkinson of what their clear obligation to British Columbians is, and it is simple. Instruct the public servants who compile these cabinet documents to send the full package of records, no pages cut out, no reports left out, to the Commission. Full stop. Our government is doing exactly that with our cabinet documents. It is far, far too late to bargain or negotiate. We have much to share with the Commission about the actions our government has taken. From the simple, like banning unsourced bulk cash transactions at casinos, to the transformational, like a new landowner transparency registry and beneficial corporate ownership registry. Despite all of the work we have done and what we still plan to do, the provincial government comes to this inquiry with an open mind and full support for the Commission's work. The Commission has government's commitment to support them as best as government is able to the extent of our jurisdiction. Outside of our legal authority, we will use persuasion to encourage agencies and governments outside of our provincial government control to support the Commission's work as well. This inquiry has an ambitious mandate, and as Attorney General, I would like to thank and recognize all the Commission staff involved and the Commissioner for taking on the significant professional and personal challenge, one that is of high importance to British Columbians across the province. We urge the Commission forward on their behalf. Fiat Justitia Ruat Selim. Thank you. Happy to take any questions you have. Okay, we'll start with questions in the room and then we'll go to the phone. We'll start with Keith, then we'll go to Richard and Vaughn. Who's first? You. Oh. Uh, two questions. Uh, did the Color Commission have subpoena powers to get these records? Yes. They have full ability to go to court to get uh, any records that they require from uh, private businesses, from government, up to and including cabinet records. They would need to explain to the court uh, why they need access to those records, but they certainly can make such applications. And secondly, the BC Civil Liberties Association, in which you are familiar with, uh, released a news release today uh, supporting the commission inquiry with expressing concern about a potential overreach by police and regulatory bodies for personal information as this inquiry uh, unfolds. Do you share that concern? Uh, it seems strange to me that there is a single person in this province, even the Civil Liberties Association, that believes that there's been overreach on the issue of money laundering. Uh, to see video of people with complete impunity walking bags full of cash into casinos uh, uh, for years uh, in our province and to conclude that uh, the police uh, and other authorities have been too repressive is bizarre. Hey, Richard. You mentioned uh, Mike DeYoung could be a witness here. How many current or former Liberal MLAs do you believe should be witnesses for this commission? The, the best part about an independent public inquiry is that, I know, but the best part about it uh, is that the decisions about who uh, should testify and who shouldn't are made by an independent commissioner. Uh, I have my own list of people who uh, I believe can and should be testifying, uh, including certainly uh, MLA DeYoung, uh, MLA Coleman, uh, uh, for their direct roles, um, but it's not up to me. Uh, there's a reason why we struck an independent public inquiry. It's up to the commissioner. If you're making a list, is former Premier Christy Clark on your list? Uh, yeah, I think, uh, you know, Christy Clark, Mike DeYoung, Rich Coleman, uh, I think they should be glad I'm not the commissioner. Anyone else? <laughs> uh, Vaughn and then Justine. Um, I want to clarify something you said during your introductory part, which is that all of this material is assembled by the public service without you even knowing what's going on. Could you say what you do know about it, which is how much material there is, and when you found out that it was even existing? Sure. 
Um, I had, uh, so uh, I take it back, I was on uh, CKNW, uh, the radio station, uh, and I was uh, speaking with Linda Steele. Uh, and uh, she asked me, you know, you had asked for a release of these cabinet records related to money laundering. Uh, and I said, you know, to the best of my knowledge, nothing had happened on this. Uh, and she played a clip from Mr. Wilkinson that said that uh, Mike DeYoung was going through the cabinet records. Uh, and I said, you know, to, to the best of my knowledge, that hasn't happened. Uh, and uh, she said, well, are you saying he's lying? And I said, well, I, you know, I, it's a big government. It's certainly possible. And so after that interview, I went back uh, and it took extensive work uh, to find out. But I then found out that there had, in fact, been uh, contact between uh, uh, MLA de Young as the appointed representative of the previous government that he had received, uh, in fact, uh, all of the records that the public service had identified as relevant to money laundering from the previous uh, cabinet. I don't know how big the package is. It might be one letter. It might be thousands of pages. I have literally no idea. Um, and uh, and that, was, that was how I found out. Uh, so all of this was happening uh, in the background, and frankly, uh, as it should be, um, but, uh, but it was surprising to me. You know how far back it uh, It's my understanding it's all of the uh, records of the previous administration going back to, to 2001. Submitted to finance ministry a suggested budget of $15 million. The budget that we got last week is 11. Uh, do you know why they didn't get the full amount they asked for and what impact it will have on the work? Um, I don't know uh, off the top of my head the difference between the 11 and the 15, but what I do know is that uh, funding uh, inquiry under the Inquiry Act is not discretionary funding by government. Government has a legal obligation to fund the Commission to the extent uh, that the Commission requires that funding. Um, so uh, I don't want to guess about the difference between the 11 and the 15, but I do know that the government has a legal obligation to fund the inquiry, that that is an aspect of their independence. Okay, we'll go to Justine and then to the phone line. Roughly, it sounded to me like you spent about half of your remarks opening up and talking about your concerns about the cabinet documents from the former government. How much of the inquiry rests on those documents? Um, well, I think it's really uh, critically important uh, for some uh, parts of the Commission's mandate that the Commission have access to the unredacted records of government in terms of the decisions that were made, the resources that were applied to this very serious problem. Uh, and without those records, the Commission, in my opinion, will really struggle to fulfill some key parts of what British Columbians are asking them to do. Um, and so uh, it, the, the fact that we're in the first uh, uh, weeks of the commission, and uh, and already um, there are individuals, uh, specifically uh, Mike DeYoung, that would like to restrict or like to have conversations about restricting uh, documents coming from government uh, is not acceptable. They need to have the full record. They need to be independent, and they need to make those decisions. Just another topic. Yeah. Uh, we're in a building that is currently protected by an injunction against protests. Um, given what's going on across Canada, what, what more does BC need to do in terms of trying to get some of these ships moving to our ports and, and uh, get things moving again? Uh, well, obviously, uh, for British Columbia, uh, we're doing everything we can to ensure that uh, goods can flow freely within the jurisdiction of our provincial government, within the borders of British Columbia. We're providing uh, support as we can to the federal government around the national issues. And uh, our hope is obviously for a quick and peaceful resolution of these matters. Uh, anything that British Columbia can do on these things, we are doing. As far as uh, any particular blockade on the ground in British Columbia, the first uh, line of response is police and their operational decisions. Uh, and if necessary, British Columbia is ready to seek injunctions uh, if required. Okay, we're going to go to the phone lines. If we have any questions, can you please identify yourself and your outlet? There are currently no questions from the queue. Perfect. Okay, great. Thank you. Thanks very much, everybody.